So on paper, Intel's new i9-9900KS looks like a bit of a flop. They've cherry-picked some of the best 9900K silicon from factory, bumped up the power target from 95 watts to 127 watts, and slapped on a little price premium for it. Strictly speaking, on a performance standpoint, the new 9900KS does give you the ability to overclock a couple hundred megahertz higher compared to the regular 9900K, but that just really doesn't provide that much benefit in real-world benchmarks or gaming. We'll see why in just a minute. But depending on what your build looks like and what the pricing looks like in your region, you might actually want to opt for the 9900KS over the regular 9900K. Okay, now before we get started, let's just make sure we're exactly clear about what's different on the 9900KS compared to the regular K version. The all-core turbo frequency has been bumped up to 5 GHz, up from 4.7 GHz on the 9900K, and the TDP is now 127 watts, up from 95 watts. TDP, which stands for Thermal Design Power, is a spec that refers to the cooling requirements for a processor. But in Intel's case, this also refers to the long duration power limit. Now, if you've seen my content on the 9900K, you'll know that some motherboards will enforce this power limit, holding the CPU within spec under sustained loads, and other boards will give the CPU as much power as it wants. For the 9900K, this means that at a 95 watt long duration power target, you'll see it hold at around just 4 GHz, but with unlimited power on tap, it'll boost to 4.7. Oddly enough, the 9900KS is advertised as a 5 GHz all-core CPU, while at the same time being advertised as having a TDP of 127 watts. These two specs, however, do not go hand in hand. At a 127 watt sustained power limit, the 9900KS will throttle to around 4.35 GHz on all-core, but when uncapped, it will comfortably hit that advertised 5 GHz all-core boost. So just keep that in mind for the 9900KS to maintain 5 GHz on all cores, it'll need a long duration power limit of around 230 watts, but it's best to just set it at the highest value possible. Now we're going to breeze over these performance benchmarks because frankly there isn't that much to see here. Basically you can just overclock the 9900K to 5 GHz to match the 9900KS's performance at stock, hence why I didn't bother testing the 9900KS at stock. It's effectively equal to the 9900K at 5 GHz, which we we already have the results for. The ability to hit 5.2 to 5.3 gigahertz on the KS, because it is bin silicon, can net you a bit of extra performance, but some programs just couldn't care less. In Blender, for example, we shave off over 30 seconds from our render time when overclocking to 5.3 gigahertz, also outpacing the overclocked 3900X with this particular Blender scene, but Adobe Premiere doesn't show any significant improvement at all, at least for encoding times. Effects like video stabilization may benefit from the additional clock speed though, just keep that in mind. When it comes to gaming, it's a bit of the same story. The overclocked 9900K is already more than enough to release any CPU bottleneck from most games. Overclocking the 9900KS to 5.3 GHz doesn't make that much of a measurable difference, and certainly not a perceivable one. At most, you're looking at around a 3% improvement if the game is very CPU clock speed dependent. This is what kids these days call a weird flex. For a high-end gaming CPU, I still believe the 9900K non-S is pretty overkill. Solely for gaming, I much prefer an overclocked 9700K as a mainstream recommendation for a high-end gaming system. The part that interests me most about the 9900KS though, since we are working with more efficient silicon, we're able to hold higher frequencies at lower voltages and in turn lower thermals and power consumption too. So I tested both the 9900K and the 9900KS on the Z390 Phantom Gaming X from ASRock, and here I wanted to see what the lowest stable voltage was for either processor at a given frequency. Personally, I didn't have any issues at all overclocking the 9900KS on this board. All I did was set the power limits to their max values, the LLC mode to level 1, and then it was business as usual. So this is where the 9900KS gets really fun to play with if you're into doing some manual tuning. Let's start at 4.7GHz, seeing as that's what the 9900KS 
1900K will naturally boost to without a power limit. Here, the 9900K required 1.184 volts to hold stable 4.7 gigahertz, whereas the 9900KS required just 1.076 volts. At 4.8 gigahertz, the 9900KS needed 1.12 volts, whereas the 9900K needed a little over 1.2 volts. Overall, the 9900KS is much more efficient silicon. Some of you may see where I'm going with this. Now at five gigahertz, a decent overclock for the 9900K at over 1.3 volts, but the 9900KS only needed 1.18 volts to hold this frequency stable in an AVX workload. 5.1 gigahertz is where I saw my 9900K tap out and there it needed a pretty hefty 1.39 volts. The 9900KS, however, can push past Past 5.1, my sample held 5.3 gigahertz, stable at 1.408 volts. I will note that at these voltages, you will need a 360 mil AIO or a custom liquid cooling solution. Of course, lower voltage means lower power consumption too. So here we're looking at the total system power consumption at the wall while rendering out a scene in Blender. So from 4.7 up to 4.9 gigahertz, there's around a 30 watt difference between the 9900K and 9900KS in favor of the KS. At 5 GHz though, that difference grows to over 50 watts, and at 5.1, the 9900KS is consuming around 70 watts less power due to the much lower V-Core that we saw in the previous chart. Also, the 9900KS does have the potential to be an absolute power hog if you let it. A more practical metric for most of you though is CPU thermals. So here we have the 9900K and 9900KS running absolutely everything equal except for the voltage required to stabilize the given frequency. For the 9900K, that's five gigahertz at 1.312 volts. And for the 9900KS, that's five gigahertz again at 1.184 volts. So here we're looking at a difference of over 15 degrees C when using a 240 mil liquid AIO. That is a massive difference. Potentially, the 9900KS could allow you to have a cooler and quieter system due to the more efficient silicon within. It could also allow you to run lower profile coolers if that's something that you're into. Or if you just want the fastest gaming CPU possible and for some reason you feel the need to overclock up to 5.3 gigahertz, then it can facilitate that too. Either way, this binned CPU could make sense for your high-end gaming machine depending on the pricing in your region. The official Intel Arc listing for the 9900KS has the MSRP listed at 513 to 524 US dollars, whereas the 9900K is listed at 488 to 499. So for a $25 US difference, I personally would just go for the 9900KS. It's a lot more efficient and it's gonna have a lot less problems being cooled in my personal small form factor systems. Having said that, if the difference was larger, say 50 to $70, then it is a lot harder to justify especially if you don't care about thermal or power efficiency, which most of you running ATX cases and maybe a 280 or 360 mil AIO probably don't care about thermal or power efficiency. However, if that is something that you do care about and you do want to run a 9900K or 9900KS at five gigahertz and you don't have a massive case with a couple 360 rads to cool it, then the 9900KS is actually a pretty viable and sensible option if the price is right. If you are interested in the 9900KS or the 9900K or maybe even the cheaper 9900KF, that's the one without the integrated GPU, I will leave links to all three down below in the description. As always guys, a huge thanks for watching. Subscribe down below if you haven't already and I'll see you all in the next one.